I know it's not very loud. I think our speakers will be louder because they have like fancy mics. Um, I'm Nancy Leffert and uh, president of Antioch Santa Barbara and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you tonight. Um, now there's a reaper. Oh well. Um, I'll let our audio people deal with that. Part of, um, it gives me great pleasure, particularly because part of my vision when I became president of this campus was to fully engage the campus in the life of our community and that this campus become a safe place, if you will, for the community to come together to discuss important topics like the topic we're gathered to discuss tonight. I am very, very grateful to our Board of Trustees who have thoroughly embraced this vision. And the topic for this evening, the future of California, immigration and education, is one of a series of fora on, on critical issues like the one we're talking about tonight that have been brought to the Santa Barbara community by our Board of Trustees. I'd like to offer my gratitude first to our sponsors this evening, Montecito Bank and Trust, Pacific Standard Magazine, Santa Barbara League of Women Voters, and trustees Dee Dee Barrett and Vicki Riskin. I also want to thank members of two committees of our board, our Hispanic Outreach Committee and our Community Outreach Committee both of whom worked on this event tonight. And uh, so I'm going to read their names, because it's two committees, it's not a short list, but Dee Dee Barrett, Papa Bacalou from our community, Lou Cannon, Marsha Cohn, Patricia Chavez Nunez, Lito Garcia, Al Munoz Flores, Barbara Yanam Johnson, Jerry Roberts, Susan Rose, Bill Rose and Gabe Queros, Alejandro Vasquez and Luis Villegas. I want to offer a special thank you to trustees Patricia chavez Nunez and Susan Rose who have shown great leadership um, to bringing this event tonight and to trustee Lou Cannon who will be moderating the discussion. And now, without further ado, I would like to introduce to you Vicki Riskin, who is chair of our Board of Trustees. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know, I just have the impulse to do this because this is very calm here and I thought I was talking. Maybe I can come out from <laughs> I need a telephone. Or I need to be as tall as Hamlet's woman. I think I will. So good evening. I want to uh, join Dr. Leffert in welcoming all of you and extending my also my gratitude to our board of trustees who put this evening together, and also to Cynthia Stewart of our staff and Steve Weir, who have done a fantastic job. Thank you. You're amazing. Uh, there's no other current issue that has so galvanized the United States and the public consciousness and the question of how we handle immigration and as a country and whether or not we should change some of our laws, which many of us think maybe we should, and to whom should we open our doors, our borders, and then what are we going to do about the some 11 or 12 million people who live in this country in the shadows and who came here hoping to live the American for me and for many of us, our forefathers, our grandparents or our parents came to this country at great risk with the hope of having a better life. And so we can understand the dreams and the ambitions of those who come here. But what are the consequences? How are we going to handle it? Tonight, to walk you through this very important discussion, we have Congresswoman Lois Capps, 
for 20 years, was a school nurse in the Santa Barbara Unified School District until 1999 when she became our Congresswoman and has continued in that role ever since. Welcome. Lois has been a great friend to Antioch University. And then we have Maricela Morales, who is Deputy Director of CAUSE. This is the Central Coast Alliance United for a Sustainable Economy. And her uh, nonprofit work covers uh, six counties in the Central Coast area and is mostly focused on economic and social justice, such important issues as minimum wage, will people be protected by health care, women's economic justice issues, and farm worker justice issues. Well, and I particularly want to welcome Mar uh, Marcelo Suarez Orozco, who came here fighting to, through traffic, no doubt, from Los Angeles, from UCLA where he is the Dean of the School of Education and Information Technology. Uh, Dr. Suarez Orozco was awarded the Mexican Order of the Aztec Eagle, which is Mexico's highest award for someone who is uh, not a national. But in addition, his work, his research of excellence and um, depth and breadth has made him a very important commentator across the global media, including the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, NPR, MSNBC, and the Washington Post. And then uh, our final panelist here is Ana Flores, who was raised in Santa Barbara, and I am proud to say she just recently graduated with her master's degree in psychology and clinical psychology, concentrating in Latino uh, mental health here at, at Antioch. She was, uh, did her BA at UCSB, and she's gonna tell us her story. But I just wanna say how particularly proud we are of you, and you were the winner of an important grant for your work, $18,000 towards your education by the state of California, so bravo to you. People <laughs> back and see that I'm actually very tall. Uh, she's actually now, you're working full time as a clinician at Pacifica Centers for Children and Families, is that right? Yes. So finally, last but not least, Um, I want to introduce Luke Cannon, who is one of our trustees here at Antioch, and who is the a treasure. Who is a, a, national, a national treasure. Um, we often have uh, intense conversations about what are the topics that are important to this community and how we can be an open platform. And then we talk and talk and talk, and then we turn to Lou and say, "What do you think?" And that's what we do. Luke Cannon was the White House correspondent for um, the Washington Post for many years, as well as the Washington Post Los Angeles Bureau Chief. And he's won countless awards, so I can't go into all of them, but one of them that stands out, I know must mean a lot to him, is that he was given the White House Correspondents Association coveted Aldo Beckman Award for his excellence in presidential journalism from his own peers. Please welcome Luke Cannon. Thank, thank you uh, very much, Vicki. And uh, it's really nice to uh, see this wonderful panel and uh, uh, I'm not playing favorites. Uh, I just want to say hello to Cap. She's not only our congressman, she's a good friend for a long time. It's really, really great to have you here. Uh, we've got a panel of distinguished one moderator, our best seen and not heard. So I'm going to call you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, guys. Yeah. Please tell me that to do it. I'll do it. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to follow the advice of one of our of our greatest presidents, Franklin Roosevelt, who said when this, one of his sons asked him, uh, "What do you do when you give a speech?" He says, "Be sincere, be brief, be seated." 
The test is set the stage. Those Just a little bit more of our featured panelists. Um, uh, there are roughly 11 million illegal or undocumented, pick your word, persons living in the United States. A report issued this month by USC's uh, Center for the Study of Immigrant Integration estimated that about 2.6 Californians, that's 7% of our state's population, are undocumented. Statewide, uh, California undocumented are, are predominantly Latino, although they're very diverse, uh, and they're concentrated in seasonal or low-wage industries, according to the report. Nearly half have lived in the United States for more than 10 years, they generated more than $31 billion in annual income despite very high levels of poverty. Now, FDR, in the language of his day, said that everybody uh, except uh, American Indians here are descendants of immigrants, even those who came over on the Mayflower. And what happens to the undocumented persons in our midst and their contributions uh, to society have an impact on us all. And without further ado, I'm going to uh, turn the microphone over to our featured speaker, uh, the eminent uh, Dr. Suarez Orozco. I want to show a brief clip, and then we'll, we'll uh, uh, share some data, and then we'll have a conversation. to be processed at Ellis Island in New York Harbor. My Irish ancestors arrived in similar style in Boston, most of them before there were any immigration laws in this country. For 62 years, Ellis Island was America's gateway for millions of immigrants. 
So if we're going to learn something about this issue from our own history, there is no better place to start. We went there with one of America's leading experts on the history of immigration, Professor Marcelo Suarez Orozco of New York University. through here at the peak. One third of our country, a hundred million people, owe their citizenship to the people who came through this great hall. Millions of dreams, stories about working to realize a better life. The sounds we're hearing in the immigration debate today in this country, the anxiety, the fear, we've heard all that before, haven't we? Yes, there's nothing more apple pie than anxiety and ambivalence. <laughs> we hear a lot of worries about crime with the illegal immigrant population that's in this country now. Hasn't that always been a worry that crime will come with them? Yes, and in fact the data show that immigrants, including and otherwise, uh, immigrants are less likely to engage in crime than comparable samples of uh, non-immigrant uh, folk in the uh, in the population, but the concern has been with us from the very very beginning. There was huge fear about gangs from Ireland. It's amazing to think a century after the Irish first began to arrive in huge numbers here in New York, in Boston, that it took JFK to put to rest that enduring concern over loyalty, over trust. That has been at the center of every immigration wave in the history of our country. At what point do we say immigration is good for us? At times of economic anxiety, today or back then, there's always a pushback. When the unemployment rate in our country is below, say, 5-6%, immigration is not an issue. When the unemployment rate begins to climb, the debate over immigration becomes they're stealing jobs, they're taking jobs away. When, in fact, economists have reasonably established that immigration generates a very uh, vigorous surplus to the US economy. We hear complaints about immigration from different sections of the country. Our southern border towns, obviously, very upset about it in, in many ways. The solution to our immigration problems in the 21st century is not going to be the control of the border. Today, unlike 100 years ago, education will play a much, much more fundamental role in the making of new, new citizens, new workers, uh, new Americans, citizens who can function in more than one language, who can have an insight into uh, cultural practices, business practices from other uh, parts of the world, will give huge advantages moving forward. The question is, do we as a country have the energy that it takes to take on that challenge? Or have we given up on the shining light that Lady Liberty symbolizes to the entire world. Joining us to talk more about where we've been and where we are. Okay, it's okay. Okay. 
Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk to, towards you so we can get uh, back to Jack. So I'm so happy to be delighted to be back in, uh, in, in Santa Barbara. He was a visiting professor at UCSB many, many years ago. He was young, and my wife's grandmother lived here in Montecito, retired here, so we used to spend uh, a lot of time. And I'm, I'm simply delighted and happy uh, to thank uh, first uh, Vicky for that warm and, and kind Santa Barbara uh, introduction, uh, the part that pertains to me, I would just say it's the kind of introduction that my father would have liked and my mother would have believed. So, <laughs> I'm delighted by your, your, your kind invitation uh, to be part of this important, uh, important uh, Roundtable discussion. Um, I want to thank uh, Mrs. Lovelace for making the connection. It was uh, actually uh, Lily who called me and uh, asked me if I would, uh, if I would do it. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm so delighted to see you again, and I'm so happy uh, to be here to share the, the panel with my with my colleagues, with the, the congresswoman on an issue that is too that is so central to the future of, of our country. What I would like to do this afternoon is to share with you the most recent data that we have on uh, the new immigration. My hope is to offer a series of reflections on the bigger picture uh, at the nexus between immigration, education, and California's future in the 21st century. I wish to share with you this afternoon a distillation of roughly three decades of basic, uh, of basic research on issues pertinent uh, to immigration, immigrant children, immigrant youth, uh, immigrant families in, uh, in our country. Uh, my hope is that we can stimulate a conversation, we can stimulate a, a discussion. Oh, this is the clever because not the, I think Cynthia has the height. Uh, can you hear me? Am I able? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, the, the fundamental question uh, that I want to, to, to stimulate this afternoon is um, how do we how do we uh, get, um, okay, this is not moving forward, but maybe I do it this way. How we can get to, um, uh, how we, we can get a California that will educate all uh, all its children. You may want to lower the lights a little bit, I don't know if you can do that. Um, um, uh, and I want to start with a reflection that goes to the heart of a fundamental feature in immigration to the United States, and that is, in our country, immigration is at once history and, as the data I'm going to share with you this afternoon, I hope makes clear, destiny. It's the, at the center of the, how we become the country we are today, and it's also fundamentally the story about the remaking of our promise as a democracy, as a culture that encompasses uh, uh, human beings from uh, the, uh, the, world, uh, the world over. Ours is one of a handful of advanced post-industrial democracies where immigration is back then, it is our, uh, it is our future. Uh, the data uh, tell a story where we are today uh, facing a very uh, substantial uh, wave of, uh, of new arrivals. This is part of a, of a cycle that has been at the making of our, of our country for, uh, for many, many centuries. The world is on the move. And for the first time in human history, every continent on Earth is experiencing the massive movement of peoples. As areas of emigration, people leaving certain regions of the world, as transit areas, and as areas of immigration. Often, by the way, all three at once. Migration, of course, did not start in Santa Barbara, it did not start in LA, it did not start in New York. The human journey 
began 60,000 years ago when our ancestors first walked out of the African savanna. Migration is written in our genetic code, it is in our bipedalism, and it, it's in our stereoscopic vision, it is in our neocortex. We're homo sapiens mobiles. It was through movement, through migration, that we became what we are. Integration is constitutive, is constitutive of the human experience. It is fundamental. It is at the center of what makes us who we are, both as a country and as a species. Yet immigration in a time of crisis creates anxieties, creates concerns. From Arizona to Norway, from Russia to Japan, from China to Britain, few topics today are fiercely debated as the socioeconomic consequences of large-scale migration, the protracted problem of mass unauthorized migration, and the long-term adaptations of the children of immigrants. Let me give you a statistic. We're less than 5% of the world's population. Today, we roughly have 20% of all unauthorized immigrants in the world. So there's something not working. Global migration intensified um, I don't know what happened, but anyway, global migration intensified very, very rapidly. Um, uh, Lou wrote the, the book on this, uh, November 9th, uh, 1989, right? What happened November 9th, uh, 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 1989? That's the day, right? That was the answer to President Reagan's famous uh, uh, statement, right? Tear down, the, tear down that wall, right? On November uh, 9th, 1989, the day the Berlin, uh, the Berlin uh, uh, Wall fell, um, uh, we have uh, uh, the beginning of a new formation. A new formation that, um, and we don't get to do this very often in, 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 in demography and, and in, the, uh, in the social sciences more, more generally, but we have a, a start date and we have an end date to something very important, very profound, transformational. The bracket here is between November 9th, 1989, and September 15th, 2008. What happened September 15th, 2008? Does anybody remember? Does anybody remember? Lemon Brothers. Lemon Brothers filed for bankruptcy, and it's the beginning of the great uh, economic uh, 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 recession. And that's the day, by the way, that the Patterns of unauthorized flow into a country and the world over began to recede significantly. We have a beginning moment and we have an end moment to a fundamental formation in our uh, in our new century. The generation that generation from uh, from uh, the end of the from the beginning of the 90s uh, to the to the first decade of the new millennium is the generation of the heady days of the end of history, the heady days of the Washington Consensus, that generation saw the explosive growth of mass migration the world over. It's the integration of markets, it's globalization that is at the very, very center of the movement of people in the 21st century. In a way, when we think about globalization, we think about the three M's, markets, new economies, fact that markets are increasingly integrated and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and interconnected, uh, media, new information, communication, and media technologies that enable the post-nationalization of production, consumption, distribution of goods and services, and the final end of globalization is human migration. During that generation, during those, those uh, that, uh, uh, those 20 years, we saw global migration going from uh, approximately 155 million in 1990 to uh, well over 250 million by the first decade of the 20th of the 21st century. In our country, well over a million immigrants entered the United States uh, year after year for 20 years. That's how we end up today with three times three times more immigrants than the second largest country of immigration in the world, the Russian Federation. In Europe, 
the continent that shed over 50 million of its souls during the last great transoceanic transoceanic exodus. That's the exodus we saw at Ellis uh, at Ellis Island. Uh, Europe now leads the way in international migration. Leicester in England will shortly become the first European city that will be, be a non-white majority. It will be a minority majority city, a uh, phrase that all of you here in Santa Barbara ought to become very familiar with because it's the future of our, of our, of our, uh, of our state. Rotterdam, Rotterdam, the largest port in the heart of Europe today, is 45% immigrant. 45% uh, immigrants. Amsterdam is going to be half immigrant, half immigrant by 2050. Uh, so Santa Barbara is not alone. Santa Barbara is in a uh, good company. Sweden, Sweden is a fascinating uh, 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 case. Sweden is a country of nine million people. Sweden sent about a million immigrants to our country. Sweden today has approximately 1.5 million. Roughly 40% of the kids in the top of the schools today come from non-Swedish immigrant origin. The best compliment I ever got was from the Queen of Sweden, uh, who uh, asked me to deliver a lecture on the nexus between immigration and education. And, 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 and uh, she came afterwards and said, I just texted my daughter and told her she should have been here to learn about the future of the country. I thought that was quite a role in the The epicenter of global migration the epicenter of the 21st century is neither the Euros nor the United States. It's, of course, Asia, right? In China alone, the insertion of China into the global system of production, consumption, services, the insertion of China into the global economy alone has generated a massive, unprecedented wave of, of, of migration. Today, it is estimated that 150 million Chinese are immigrants in their own country. There are more children in China today that are migrants than there are people in Canada. About 40 million children, the vast majority, by the way, illegal immigrants in their own country. We can talk to how we get to that problem, perhaps when, uh, when we have uh, uh, discussion. Likewise, the insertion of India into the global system of, uh, of, of, of into global capitalism is generating a breathtaking new dynamic. The insertion of India into the global economy, it means that 31, 31 rural to urban migrants arrive per minute in a city in India today for a total of approximately 700 million people by the midpoint of the 21st century, more than two United States combined. So again, I would say it is not a Santa Barbara issue, it is not a Los Angeles issue, it is not a New York issue, a Boston issue, a Chicago issue. Immigration in the 21st century defines the reality of all, nearly all, high income, uh, high income uh, countries. Um, by 2010, Nine of the top ten leading countries of immigration to our country were Latin American, Caribbean, or Asian. This is, represents a basic discontinuity with the history of immigration to the United States. Up to the 1960s, over 80% of all immigrants to our country were Europeans. That's, of course, the hour. That's, that's literally uh, uh, history. Today, the new immigration, the so-called new immigration, is very, very concentrated. And Latin America, of course, leads the way. One third of the foreign born population in the United States, one third, is now of Mexican origin. 55% is Latinos of Latin American origin, Mexico, Caribbean, and South America. Two recent and notable developments, what we call it, it's called the new, new immigration, or the new normal in immigration, and that is that the rate of unauthorized became interrupted. And it became interrupted really as a function of the uh, co collapse of uh, the uh, US economy following um, the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers and the beginning of the 
great recession. Fundamentally, what Lehman Brothers did is what 9-11 did not achieve. After 9-11, we deployed the largest military campaign in the history of our country at the southern border. The net effect of the massive investment of force at our southern sector was negligent. After 9-11, more unauthorized immigrants crossed the border than before 9-11. The, the interruption in terms of the economic cycle that generates a powerful vacuum bringing in new immigrants is what interrupted two generations of uninterrupted unauthorized immigration into, uh, into, the, uh, into the United States. Uh, Migration is a human phase of, of, uh, of uh, globalization. It is a global issue. It is fundamentally a function of globalization's utopic promise. And of course, it's destructive after that. Fundamentally, it is a reality of the 21st century that makes culturally, cultural diversity increasingly normative in the world's large cities. This is the reality of Santa Barbara. This is the reality Los Angeles is the reality throughout the world. Our cities today are more diverse in terms of languages, religions, ethnicities than ever before. In Miami, in Madrid, in Moscow, such as in global cities the world over, diversity defines the demographic, social, and cultural reality. In our two largest cities, if you take Los Angeles and New York, children from over 190 and 80 different countries and territories get up, walk to schools, take buses, take, take subways, get into cars to go to our schools every morning. That is something that simply never happened before in the history of humanity. The global cities today encompass the entire range of the human, uh, of the human uh, condition. The ideal of the German romantics of a thick between language, identity, um, the region, the folk, the folk in, in von Herder's terminology is made increasingly anachronistic by the forces of globalization. The great poet of Brooklyn, Walt Whitman, wrote beautifully the eternal words, I contradict myself, I contain multitude. The advanced post-industrial nation state contradicts itself. It contains multitudes. This is the reality of a cosmopolitan world moving forward. Immigration, immigration is a, above all, a, an ethical act of and for the family. If globalization is the macro context, of uh, the mac macro context of migration, the family is It is an ethic of family nurturance, reciprocity, and caregiving that animates global migration today as it did in history. It is what drives Ukrainians and Uzbeks to Russia, Indians, Indonesians, and Filipinos to the Gulf countries. It is what drives um, Senegalese, Algerians, and Moroccans to France. It is what drives Chinese to Canada, Brazilians to Japan. And of course, of course, Mexicans, Central Americans, South Americans, and the entire world to Santa Barbara. It is because immigration is of and for the family where immigrant workers become a central piece of economy and societies, families and children will follow. You can't escape that matter. Immigrant children now are the fastest growing sector of the child population, not only in California, this is true in Canada, this is true in Australia, this is true in New Zealand, this is true in Germany, this is true in Sweden, and on and on and on. In fact, all of these high income countries are facing exactly the same unprecedented rapidly aging native populations, below replacement fertility rates in the native population, and a gap in terms of uh, active workers producing in the labor market 
and retirees that cannot be sustained with the current demographic momentum. Germany is a perfect example, a country of 80 billion people. Germany without immigration will shrink. Because the model is 20 years, 40 years. Beyond that, you cross the line between science and science fiction, and you get to a Germany that eventually shrinks to about 20 same models can be developed in Sweden, Spain, or Italy for a variety of countries uh, the, world, uh, the world over. Global migration generates always an echo, a demographic echo. As families reunite, children of immigrants take the same place. In the United States, as in dozens of high income countries, children of immigrants are now the fastest growing sector of the, of the child population, and the majority in our country of all our growth moving, uh, moving forward. For the first time in the history of our country, Latinos and Asians now account for all the growth in the United States. And these data, these are the data that tell the story of what happens, happened between 2000 and 2010. And that's a story that tells you you have um, the rate of, of childbirths among Latino and Asian children uh, has skyrocketed by more 5.5 people, you have a, a concurrent decline in the population of white uh, births by a lot of rapidly uh, forming uh, uh, children. In our country today, we have 5.5 million children growing up in households headed by unauthorized parents. Roughly 4 million of these children are citizen children. They're, citizen, they're children who are born in the United States. They're children that kind of harm in the, in the most important chapter in the origins of totalitarianism, chapter 8, which it theorizes what happens in a democracy when citizens lose the right to have rights. He said there are 4 million children, citizen children in our country, who day in and day out lose the right to have rights. We did the first most systematic study of what happens to these children in terms of their, their human development and their transition to education into the labor market. And what we discovered is that by age three, we begin to document cognitive gaps as a function of the shadow, net of all other factors. The children of the unauthorized pay an additional penalty that translates into cognitive delays that we can measure by age three. Citizen, citizen children, part of our fastest growing uh, demographic. Of course, uh, nearly half of the first generation in our country today, I mean, Lou had the data from our colleagues at USC, um, are, are heavily concentrated in, uh, in, uh, in our state. Half of the first generation immigrant origin in our country today is an authorized immigrant children, account for one in three children under the age of, uh, of eight. Of course, in a number of states, including above all, of course, in California, the, the, the uh, child age population is now minority majority. These are states where you look at the cumulative low indigenous population, it tells you the story of where we are. In many states, of course, this is the future. The eyes of the world are on California. We can't make it work in California if we can't respond to the imperative of connecting with our fastest and serving all our children, connecting with our fastest growing demographic. We have a problem Houston. We have a real problem moving, uh, moving forward. Nationally, today, roughly 24% of the school age children in the United States are the children of immigrants. The majority of them second generation citizen children, the rest more and more. Approximately 10% of all school age children in our country today are classified as an English language uh, learners. The National Center for Education Statistics estimates that between 1980 and the, 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 the end of the, of the 21st century, the percentage of children who spoke a second language at home more than doubled from about 10%. Education systems the world over are facing unprecedented challenges and opportunities. 
educating a, a ever more diverse cohort of students, <coughs> greater levels of competency at a time when economies and societies are more integrated and more vulnerable to global. Forces taken in the lives of children growing up today and are an ever more complex network of interlinked micro, meso, and macro variables. Education today is more important than ever before in human history, and it will be more important to the children of immigrants now than in any other wave of immigration in the history of our country. A hundred years ago, when the clip from Ellis Island uh, evokes a story, the connection between immigrants and education was very weak in the first and second generation. We can look, we can go over the statistics of the number of Irish, the number of Italians, the number of European Jews, that went through our school systems and the data are underwhelming. Fundamentally, it took almost two and a half, perhaps three generations to make that connection. Today, we don't have three generations to connect with our new, uh, our new uh, immigrants. <clears throat> While the case for education has been made before, I think it's fundamental that we think about the principles that ought to underpin the conversation about why should education, here we are at Atlantic University, why should education be a public good? How do we think about the fundamental factors that structure our thinking as to why should a society come to see education as a public good to support and to cherish? I start, of course, with the Greeks, with Aristotle. Aristotle fundamentally saw education as liberation. Aristotle saw education as fundamental to the flourishing, right, what the Greeks call eudaimonia. The idea that it is through education that you achieve autonomy and self-governance, self, uh, that you fully realize the human, uh, the human potential. Unfortunately, in our current Debates about immigration have present company accepted. We don't, our, our, our politicians don't fundamentally take us to the roots of why should we think of education as something um, to support and, uh, and to value. Of course, education is linked to the idea of citizen, citizenship, civic engagement, belonging, social cohesion which is fundamental for a culturally plural democracy like the United States. Of course, uh, this is where all politicians are very happy to raise their voices. Education, lastly, I would say, ought to be a fundamental tool for the transition of the next generation to the ever more integrated global labor market of the 21st century. We think education as a function of the 21st century not as a function of the, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the 20th century. To conclude then, I'd like to uh, reflect on the uh, importance of educating all Californians, and while the practical uh, results of education should be larger, we are, that ought to be the beginning and not the end of the, uh, the uh, conversation. What should be the purpose of a formal education? What are its relationships to a happy life, to a socially cohesive plural democracy? How can education be put to the service of human freedom, of human dignity, of human solidarity? How, finally, should education be connected to lifelong learning, to lifelong growing. While these are essential questions that have been a part of the archaeology of education in many traditions, Western and Eastern uh, alike, globalization subverts the parochial tendency to think about local realities in bounded nation states. The paradox of the 21st century remains that while education is local, the deep problems that will shape the future 
are indisputably global. The tensions between these two powerful truths are increasingly obvious. Only the education of all of California's children will lead us out of the paradox that we live local lives in a global world. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we're going to do an executive uh, intervention here. Um, first of all, I want to say that the human capacity to suffer in silence with this little buzz has been remarkable. Let's turn things off here so that we can get this sound back in, in order before we continue, if that's okay with you, Lou. Yeah. Um, take your mics off. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and maybe you just want to. Well, can we just hand the mic down to the uh, partis to the participants? Okay. okay. Lou, I'm going to turn it back over to you, and they can just use this hand mic. So we can take this thing off. Okay. If everybody can hear this, and the, and the uh, buzz is stopped. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to pass this hand mic down to uh, everyone. We've just had this really wonderful global overview. And we're now going to get an on-the-ground view next from uh, Maricela, who uh, uh, is trying, her organization is trying to empower people. And we're going to hear from you. I'm going to give you this one. The buzz is still there. The buzz is in the... It's not the... It's Testing, testing. One, two, three. The buzz is... the video the buzz is not the from the handheld mic, not the lavalier mic. Why is that? It's never done it. I have no idea. And I had it muted. No, it's it's it's. Hey, it's not the buzz. It's not the buzz. Yeah, it's not the buzz. I agree. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the Antioch University Santa Barbara Board of Trustees for selecting immigration reform as the topic for today's uh, trustee forum. The Central Coast Alliance, United for a Sustainable Economy or CAUSE, was created in 2001 to organize at the local level. Um, going off of what Dr. Marcelo shared just now, uh, in a way we're sort of educators in the community by action uh, in terms of democracy and leadership and advocacy. So at the local level, um, our work is to bring about our vision, which is that together we can create a local to global community where we all benefit from, as well as contribute to, an economy that is just, prosperous, and environmentally healthy. Positive work is rooted in values of integrity, hope, human dignity, and social justice. And we work for humane and just comprehensive immigration reform from these values. There are both challenges as well as great opportunities in this work. When we look back on immigration policy, we find a historical context of exclusion, dehumanization, and hostility that unfortunately continues today. U.S. immigration policy dates back to 1790, when the first U.S. Naturalization Act denied citizenship to all but free white persons. While this included free white women, citizenship could only be inherited through the white father. From there, we had the 1868 um, Naturalization or Citizenship Act, which allowed for citizenship by birth for the first time. And in this case, it included, it excluded Native Americans. In 1882, we had the Chinese Exclusion Act. In 1921, we had the Emergency Quota Act. And it instituted quotas as a way to um, ensure that Western Europeans were allowed in greater numbers rather than Eastern Europeans. In 65, this, the quotas were discontinued, but um, they explicitly prohibited, quote, sexual deviance, which referred to lesbian sexual and gay people. So I mention this because this immigration work um, does bring up some very deep 
issues that are rooted really in, in fear of strangers. That despite the fact that, as Dr. Marcelo said, immigration or migration is in our genetic code as humans, that we migrate to survive and to aspire to the best within us. That when it comes to policy, unfortunately we've seen that in many ways the worst in us comes out. That part of us that is afraid of people who look different from us and who also um, are of lower economic classes. Because by far, uh, immigrants are in low-wage sectors, as um, Lou mentioned earlier. Um, one of the amendments uh, that was proposed uh, was to um, uh, allow unauthorized immigrants who were domestic workers. So, um, making sure that those folks who could afford it <laughs> um, could have their undocumented nanny or their undocumented housekeeper okay? um, so in the service the wealthy. Another amendment that was um, put forth on the other end to exclude low-wage workers was that um, you would have to earn $92,000 in order to start the pathway to citizenship. So I don't know how many people in this, in, in this room or in this community you know, earn $92,000, but um, the majority of the immigrants who are low-wage workers in construction, in hospitality and leisure, in farm work, um, earn about $16,000 a year, which is $8 an hour minimum wage full-time work. So with our immigration reform policies, um, what we have to realize is that there is a lot of xenophobia and that there's also um, a lot of um, uh, denial of rights and protections for low-wage workers within that process. And so um, here in Ventura and Santa Barbara County, we're working just in the face of these you know, ugly um, realities um, to work from a place of hope and inspiration. Because in fact, in this country, it, it has been always hope and inspiration, the best in us, that has brought us forward. If we look at the abolitionist movement, if we look at the suffragist, suffragist movement, right? It was people coming together, recognizing that we all do share a common humanity. And that it's the best in us that, um, can win um, against the worst in us, our fear. And so we organize. We organize in Ventura County, Santa Barbara, Santa Maria, and we bring people together around this common notion that immigrants are contributing to our economy. Immigrants are just everyday people who are striving to survive and um, who are wanting to stay together with their families. I really appreciated Dr. Marcelo mentioning that, that sort of at its more core um, level, it's about the ethics of, of family. What's being proposed right now is actually to change that. So we have had a, what's been called in general, a family-based immigration system where you can petition via family. That is being proposed um, to, be, um, to be changed in favor of what called a merit-based visa, where you will apply based on points, and the points relate to your um, education, your work experience, um, but not, um, you know, relevant, doesn't take into account family. So what will become of our social fabric if we are, if new immigrants are not allowed to bring their families with them um, and continue their, you know, their life and their family um, so that's something very serious for, for us to, to, to uh, keep in mind. In Santa Barbara County, one out of um, every 10, approximately, people are uh, without documents, are so-called unauthorized, 90%. A big part of that is because Santa Barbara County is an agricultural county. And so farm workers, um, it's estimated that as many as 90% of our farm workers are undocumented. 
So keeping that in mind, we're working with faith, labor, student, environmental, business, and community organizations and, and sectors um, to fight for comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, we've met with all of our electeds. We've held press conferences and rallies and gathered um, you know, over a thousand signatures, sent people to Washington, D.C. So this is the power that we have as communities, where each of us individually come together and we become a force to be reckoned with. <clears throat> so what are we up against? We're up against further militarization of the border. Since 1995, Till now, all of our attention has been our border security. With the failure of immigration reform in 06, 07, and 2010, security measures were put, were put forth. Those security measures have, uh, and goals have been implemented and not exceeded. <clears throat> What's come with that is deaths along the border. So in 95, there were approximately 59 deaths, people trying to cross the border. 2012, it was 460. So the further militarization of the border um, has very human, mortal impacts. Uh, the current proposal is to further militarize the border. <clears throat> Dr. Machado showed a slide where 30% of, of, of immigrants are from Mexico. Well, the citizenship to pathway, uh, the pathway to citizenship <clears throat> right now is linked to border security. So. Um, if 90% of the border is not deemed to be secure, then the 11 million cannot become legal permanent residents. So even though only 30% um, of the current of the immigrants that are here came from Mexico, all 100% of the unauthorized immigrants will be held hostage from getting their legal permanent residency until we can prove that 90% of the border is secure. So it's, it's untenable. Um, and so we're here, Cause, uh, to work with all of you, anyone who is uh, inspired by our shared humanity, who is inspired by our legacy of justice in this nation that brings us together as opposed to tearing us apart, to work together to provide the support that our Congress needs to need. Um, in order to pass humane, fair, and just immigration reform that upholds family unity, that begins a direct pathway to citizenship, and that limits the militarization of the border. Thank you. Before we hear Hannah's story, I wanted to say something I should have said at the beginning. You know, you have little white cards. And you, uh, uh, and if you have a question, uh, just put the question on the card, and, and you can do it in Spanish or English. We, uh, Cynthia has seen that there are translators here, and we'll uh, try to deal with uh, some of your questions. Now, Anna, the mic's yours. Actually, we're going to, if you're going to disclose, we're going to go a little bit to ask
somehow he had already started the process of trying to get a um, residency, but it was just too stressful for my mother, so she decided that she was gonna surprise him one day and just come here and cross the border illegally. So we did that, and it was a very traumatic experience. I was five years old, and I still remember um, along the way our journey, we were robbed, we went through a lot of horrible things just to be able to come here. Finally, we made it here, and um, my dad was always working. He wore two jobs. I remember being five years old, and my job, my only one job in Georgia, was to wake up my dad every night at 11 o'clock at night. He would, we lived in Isla Vista, he would drive to the carpenteria, work as a janitor at Lucky's, and he worked from 11.30 till like 4 in the morning. He would then get off work at 4 in the morning, take a nap for a couple of hours in the car, and then work construction from 8 to 5. He did that for 20 years, 20 years of his life. He never once complained. He was always hardworking. My mom, we were undocumented at the time, so she couldn't really get a job. She would babysit, she would clean houses, she did whatever she could to help my dad. Um, eventually, we um, obtained um, legal residency and then citizenship. But I still rem I was about 11 years old when this happened, but I still remember even after that happened, that didn't really make a difference um, from what I experienced. It was always constant discrimination from peers, teachers, um, the community, just the message was very clear, like you don't belong here, you have to Mexico, what are you doing here? Growing up, I remember school counselors telling me, be realistic, you can never go to college, you should just do a vocational training and just, you know, be something small, don't think you can get college education. So that was very confusing for me. I remember being in high school and my peers getting ready to go visit different colleges with their parents and they asked me, have you gone to any colleges? Have your parents taken you? My parents worked two jobs. They couldn't afford to take the day off and take me. So I said, no, I haven't. And they couldn't believe that my parents were so irresponsible, so horrible that they couldn't take me like their parents were able to. And for me, that was very confusing because it's like, my parents were on the mirror. They did everything they could to give me a better life.
nobody wanted to work with me because they had already made assumptions about me. It was when I started getting the highest grades in class that everybody didn't want to work with me. <laughs> they don't think. But anyway, I say that now, and you know, I laugh about it, but at the time it wasn't funny, it was hurtful. It was like, why? Why am I getting this? I don't deserve it. I didn't do anything to you. It just really made me work harder. I graduated with honors, and again, my dad was very happy, and he came up to me and he said, you know, all the hard work that, you know, I had to, and all the things I had to go through, all the sacrifices I made, um, my dream came true. Like, my child, my youngest child graduated from college. So then when I decided to pursue my master's, um, my family was thrilled. But at the same time, they really didn't understand. I couldn't really celebrate a lot of the things that I wanted to celebrate with my parents because they really truly didn't understand. They were proud of me, but they really didn't understand that, you know, it takes time. They were really like, so where, when are you going to start your career? When are you going to work? <laughs> You're making all this money now, right? And I'm like, no, not really. It doesn't really work that way. So I'm happy to say I just recently completed a master's program here, and I plan on applying UCLA. <laughs> That's one of my top choices. Um, so I plan on continuing, and I'm just so grateful to my parents, again, to all the program, all the instructors here at Young. Um, I'm sorry, Professor Serena is one of them. He's just been amazing. Al has been one of them too, he's not here. Um, just the people that kind of along the way have helped me, not just connected me with people and resources, but just really um, told me how proud they are, how they believe in me. Um, I'm having a hard day, and they're like, hey, come in my office, what's going on? It just took the time to really just listen to me and hear me out when I'm having a hard day. Um, I'm happy that I got to share my story with you guys. This is just my story. I'm not here. I want to be respectful and say I'm not here to represent all immigrants. I'm here to just represent myself and share my story. and. Um, it's been really hard to be here. I don't consider myself a victim. I don't feel sorry for myself. Sometimes I can get emotional talking about this because it's been really hard. But I'm really proud of myself. And I've had to work really, really hard to get to this point. And um, one of the reasons why I decided to do this is because I feel like it's my duty to give back to my community. Um, I've been blessed enough to be able to work with you um, in the community. And a lot of the same things I went through when I was a child. I see a lot of young people that are so angry because, like me, they're immigrants. They weren't, they didn't ask to come here. They were just brought here. And they face a lot of discrimination because of that. And a challenge for me has been, how do I look at a young person in the eye and tell them to, to continue if they tell me, I'm undocumented. Some of those stories are true, some of them are not. Some people get lucky and they get connected with the right people and are able to pursue higher education. But that's not the case for most people. And you know, I just hope that one day they're able to, to get the opportunity that I had hoped because I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. Judiciary Committee passed legislation in, uh, and the full Senate is supposed to take it up in uh, late in June. But the prospects in the House are what everybody is concerned about. So I hope that you will give us the inside and the lowdown. Will this bill, will this bill or some version of it get to the House? Oh, Lou, thank you. And, and I want to hear your viewpoints too, because he's been, you've been watching this unfold over many years. First of all, I'll say thank you all for being here at this afternoon. And I, as I heard the panelists, each one, make their presentation, I had this fantasy 
I think you might appreciate it as well. I wish I could close my eyes for a second and open it, and you wouldn't go away. But behind you, filling in everywhere, would be all 435 of my colleagues in the House of Representatives. <laughs> I think uh, Dr. Marcelo Suarez Rosco gave us a wonderful framework out of which to understand this uh, complicated, uh, challenging topic, uh, which is so rooted in who we are as Americans. Marcella, my, my counterpoint here, uh, is going to refute everything I tell you about it in terms of what we, uh, the, the gang of eight in the Senate has been able to put together for a comprehensive bill. And I'll just have to counter with and say, in my real world, we have to do what lies before us if it's not totally harmful. But, Anna, yours is a story I wish my colleagues all could hear. Because it's the American's dream story, isn't it? That she took what she was given and made a beautiful thing, is making a very beautiful thing of it. And she underscores the the most wonderful truth about our country, which is that we are a nation of immigrants. Almost all of us here uh, came from somewhere. And so uh, we should be proud of that history. Um, and on top of that, we have an immigration system that's totally broken, totally broken. Holding our country back, holding our economy back, and breaking dreams every single day. I then uh, focused on this topic because I do think we have a window of time. Um, and they don't come along very often, and I don't want us to blow this window. So I've been conducting a series of meetings up here on the Central Coast to talk about what are the effects of having this broken immigration system on our uh, economy as, and, our, <coughs> and our community as we know it. I met with some high-tech companies in Goleta, and they are so frustrated by seeing the bright students come to school at UCSB and up in North, it's in Cal Poly, on visas, student visas, getting the best education, getting inspired to join one of the high-tech companies on the Goleta uh, corridor, and right then their student visa expires and they're gone. And that huge investment that we made in them in our educational system is not ours to read in terms of how the effect of that will be on us. Excuse me, I have to. Uh, <coughs> this is the tail of the cold. Anyway, <coughs> I know we don't have a mic. <laughs> and I've met with agriculture leaders, the growers up and down the Central Coast, who are so frustrated. They want to hire people here legally. <coughs> and they want a stable and consistent workforce, and they want to make sure that their people are documented that they're hiring. And they can't be sure of that. Even though the e-verify system is what they're trying to use, they're not sure it's absolutely going to work. I've, worked, I've met with workforce and labor organization want to make sure that workers' rights are protected, that fair wages are given to those who come, and that they not unduly who are already here. When I met with clergy in north, the northern part of the district in here in Santa Barbara and just this afternoon with the Archbishop of Los Angeles and his representative who hosted a meeting uh, on, on this very topic and we're going to meet again with a similar group in Santa Maria this week. So I've been listening. Most importantly, I've met with families who are struggling and who are torn apart and who see the of our broken immigration system. <clears throat> so this is a, this is an important economic issue, but it's also a moral issue, which we must address now. So we have some momentum after the last election. And I'm pleased that there is a bipartisan bill in the Senate and the rudiments of one in the House. many of the goals that I support. So I'm going to give you a brief overview and then hope to collect my voice for the questions. <coughs> but I hope you have some. 
The Senate bill has four main components, border security measures. And the truth is that the growers will tell you the border has been tightened. It's really hard now to get across the border. The second provision in the Senate, which is critical, is that it provides a pathway to citizenship, an earned pathway to citizenship, and an expedited path for dreamers and agriculture workers. Third, that it creates an employer verification system, making sure that everybody's playing by the same rules, and protects legal workers and ensures a steady workforce. And fourth, the Senate bill makes sure that we have a stronger visa system for a future flow of immigrants, and that we have stronger oversight over employers so that this new workforce is not taken advantage of. Again, this is just a framework in the Senate, but there is a bipartisan team at work in the House with a similar bill that's being proposed there. That's why we have an opportunity now, as we never have before during the time that I've been in Congress, to do something about this. And I want to make sure that it happens this year and that we don't squander this precious time that we have, which is why I'm so grateful that you're all here and motivated on this topic. <laughs> Just so you know, and now stop and collect my. I've, been in, I've always been a strong supporter of comprehensive immigration reform. I've been in support of the Reunited Families Act, which reduces family immigration visa backlogs and promotes reunification of immigrant families. I've supported the DREAM Act, and I've supported Ag Jobs, which concentrates on so I apologize again for my voice, but I look forward to the opportunity for us to engage in conversation. Another question that 
uh, Marcelo is raising about militarizing the border, but isn't it as a practical matter going to be necessary, even though there are, are many people, including me, who think there's plenty of security on the border anyway, that you're going to have to do more in order to get the bill through to get the motion in? There is the, the one big poison pill in the House is the thought <coughs> that the speaker has been saying we're going to do one piece at a time. That we can't do. But the rest of it we can do in the House. In other words, if we say, if we let him get away with we can do the dream act and nothing else, We'll never do the part that it's always done. If you have a question, please pass it down this way. It will. <coughs> Is it this I don't know. Uh, the question is this. Uh, the 11 million undocumented uh, that not going to have good citizenship, 90% of the border is secure. Is that what you said, whoever, whichever you said it? <laughs> First, I, I, I want to say that um, we at COTS feel that um, uh, that our work um, is, is to continue the, the, the legacy and the work that's been done in this country um, you know, to push for our highest ideals and to do that in uh, based in research and based in the power of the community. And um, you know, having worked for the last dozen years with elected officials because ultimately our work has to do with public policy from the city level to the you know, county level to state and national level, we fully realize that there are realities um, of who actually gets to decide. And um, you know, to the point that Congresswoman Taps um, you know, made in terms of um, we have a framework that for as bad as, as, as far from ideal as we think it is, um, we're also having to reconcile with the reality that it may be the only thing that we can get. If the only thing that we can get is protection for 11 million people not to be deported, which as I understand it right now, that's basically what we're getting. People can work legally and can travel legally out of the country. That's basically, at this point, what they get. Um, you know, from a, uh, you know, a democratic perspective in terms of our ideals of recognizing the full humanity of everybody, um, that we do not exist just to work, that um, our labor um, should open us up to receive uh, public benefits if we need them, if our employer does not provide health insurance and we're making minimum wage and we don't qualify for the health care reform act, then we will have to end up in the emergency room and draw on those public resources. Um, and so, um, so we are committed to doing everything we can to bring about the most just and humane um, immigration reform with you know, the, the, the very real reality that this will just be the beginning. So part of our um, uh, imperative right here is to be clear <coughs> about how challenging this is, and that even if we pass what's on the table, which is tenuous, it's tenuous in the Senate, and Congresswoman Capps knows best from anybody here how challenging it will be in the House, okay? But if we can pass this, it's to know that, that the struggle does not end, that that will be the beginning of an open door but that we have much work ahead. In terms of um, the 11 million in the pathway to citizenship and the border security, so as it's, as, as it's proposed now in the Senate, um, you can't get your provisional status, so that's not your green card, and that's certainly not citizenship. You can't get what will be a new status, with, which is provisional, uh, registered provisional immigrant, RPI. So it's not your green card, it's a provisional status where you can work legally and you can travel legally. That's what you get. You can't apply until the Department of Homeland Security um, submits 
a plan, and they have six months to do it, a plan for border security. So whether that happens in six months, or a year, or 18 months, we don't know, but they have six months to put forth a border security plan that's approved. So you will remain without any documentation whatsoever until that happens. So the law will pass, but until that plan is approved, a minimum of six months, you, you can't apply for it. So at whatever point those plans are approved, six months, a year, 18 months, you will have a year to apply for a provisional status. To get your provisional status, then for a minimum of 10 years, a minimum of 10 years, you will be in provisional status. At 10 years, if the goals of border security are not met, then you cannot apply for legal permanent residence. Oh, wow. So, so that's what we're talking about, that, that if this passes, you know, quite frankly, I mean, talk to, you know, Anna, talk to anybody else who's ever been undocumented. If, if at the very least you don't have to worry about being deported and torn apart from your family, that is something huge. If you can work legally, if you can travel to your home country and visit you know, your mom, your sibling, who you haven't seen in 20 years, okay? that means a lot. Okay? It means a lot, all right? Um, at the same time, okay, it is not legal permanent residency, and it is, you, you can't get any benefits, you're paying you know, taxes, if you retire during that 10 year period, you paid into Social Security, you will not get Social Security, right? So there will still be a lot of work to do. So we, 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 we just want to be you know, frank and, and, and open about the details. And, and what it comes down to, again, is our power. Okay? You know, there's a lot riding on Congresswoman's half shoulders and, and all of our allies in Congress. You know, it's up to us you know, to share with our family and friends, especially in districts where we don't have allies who are in Congress or in the Senate, you know, to move them. That's our power. That is our power, you know, to do everything that we can to educate ourselves and to come together and to advocate, you know, for the best that we can get. And to know that this is part of, you know, our continued legacy. You know, people fought for us, you know, seven generations back. You know, this is us. This is our time, you know, to fight for you know, the people today are on the margins and in the shadows. Yeah, uh, we're, 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 we're already past the time. We got a lot of questions. I'm going to just select a couple of them because it's not just uh, uh, we're going to uh, run. Uh, there, are two, there are two questions for you, uh, uh, Professor, and they sort of get us away from where we've been. But, but, but one of them, I wonder too, when you, when you put the chart up there, it, 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 the question is, why has board boredom become the elephant in the class? <laughs> And another question is about these, um, um, there's recent news reports, as I'm sure people here are aware, of riots in heavily immigrant areas of, of Western European cities, which, what, is this, what does this tell us about the <coughs> you know, backlash to, to, to immigration, to, to this vast global migration that you're talking about? Thank you so much, and uh, I'll be yes, a great as I can, as I can uh, you have to read the books on the, why boredom is the elephant in, uh, in the classroom. We did, uh, I think, 20 years ago, a basic study for uh, Stanford at that time. We simply asked kids to do a sentence completion test for school kids. But the normative response uh, is uh, boredom. Most the phenomenology we experience for most children, for most groups in our country today is one of boredom. Uh, this is just an empirical fact. It's very interesting, right? As I travel around the world, um, 
this, I think, is a global phenomenon. It's not just that. Uh, you know, Tolstoy starts uh, Anna Karenina with the beautiful first sentence. All families are happy in the same way, and each family is happy in its own way. When uh, you look at education, all of the families in the high income world are unhappy in the same way. And it fundamentally has to do with this failure to connect, I mean, particularly. Populations. Uh, this is the European issue. Uh, Lou, I think what you're talking about is the riots in, in Sweden uh, last week in Tiensta. We did a big project in, in, in Tiensta. Uh, we wrote a book uh, uh, on the uh, on the issue, the issues facing uh, the Swedes today, uh, and um, it's a way in which all families are unhappy the same way. We are not connecting productively with our new populations. Um, the Europeans have a, a phenomenon that's very different from our own. I spend a lot of time. I, I thought I was visiting with the Paris, did projects in Germany, in Sweden, because um, visiting the president in Spain. Uh, I, Holy Father, the third Holy Father, now has invited me to Rome to talk about this, this fundamental problems in. Uh, Western world, which is um, uh, we uh, are unable to reimagine the social contract when the generations look so different from each other. Um, uh, if you look at the asymmetry, the generational asymmetry in our country, it has no precedent. All of the children are children of color. All our established citizens uh, do not reflect that democracy. How do we reimagine the social contract when the populations look so different? We have a fundamental advantage over the Europeans, and it goes as follows. In Europe, immigration is fundamentally endogamic. You stay within your group. The American story, 150 years ago, 100 years ago, today is one of exogamy. One of my colleagues at Harvard, is a professor at Harvard for many years, put it beautifully. In the United States, balkanization was defeated at the altar. All groups, and we were talking about this earlier, it was Moynihan and Nat Glazer, I mean, professors at Harvard who wrote that book. In the United States, all immigrant groups over time gravitated towards marrying outside their own groups. That's the American story. That happened with the Irish, that happened with East European Jews, that happened with every wave of them. If you're a Latino today, if you're a first generation Puerto Rican in New York City, 30% in the first generation will marry non Puerto Ricans. That's the American. If you're a second generation Asian woman in our country, you are today more likely to marry somebody that is not Asian than somebody that is Asian. Over time, we've triumphed in the three fundamental domains of adaptation. One is our immigrants connect to the labor market. Yes. This is very different from the European story. If you look at the data in New York for the undocumented immigrants, they have a connection to the labor market that is fantastic. This is the story of Anna and a parent. People come to, to work two, three jobs. There are no, uh, the data on this are univocal. The data on this is why they won't be long see riots. People are working. Second, in our country, you know, another one of my colleagues, Peter Peter, but the U.S. is a cemetery for languages. The Germans brought German, the Japanese brought Japanese, the Italians brought Italian, all those languages were buried in our country. In our country, linguistic uh, acculturation is breathtakingly fast. We have a pattern of gravitation to English and second language also. By the third generation, both Latino kids can say good morning to their grandmothers in Spanish. Yeah. And the third is this exogamic principle. In our country, people tend to, you know, engage in, let's call it, ethnic flight. You stay within your group in the first generation, little by little, the American story has been this transculturation story. So this is very, very different from the ghettos in Europe, where marriages are endogamic. If you're a Kurdish immigrant in Stockholm, you're going to marry another Kurd. You know, I'm from Argentina, my wife is Swiss. Our kids, 
The last thing I can imagine is that I'm going to tell my kid, I want you to marry somebody from Argentina, or we want you to marry somebody from Switzerland. That will kill the deal right there. <laughs> kids ain't going to do that. That's the American story. So, but the final point I want to make is, what I'm confused about is the disconnect between the reality that the data tell me and this kind of policy world that is so unconnected. Mexican immigration to the United States is coming to an end. Mexican fertility rates have collapsed. Yes. The average woman in Mexico a generation ago had seven live births. Today, the average woman in Mexico has 2.3 live births. The Mexican economy, I mean, there's the parenthesis of the chaos that the war, the narcotics is generating. But if you put that in a parenthesis, the Mexican economy will surpass the Brazilian economy. The world today is divided between BRICS and BRICS, right? BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China. The Mexican economy surpasses Brazil as one of the fastest growing economies in the hemisphere. So we're believing unauthorized immigrants, meaning more people are leaving than they are coming in. Let's not forget that the president of the United States, Barack Obama, has deported more people than any president in US history. 400,000 families have become separated, torn apart, dismembered by this, uh, by this policy. It doesn't add up. Illegal immigration is yesterday's problem. The problem today is assimilation. It's uh, integration. It's connecting with the children of immigrants, like Anna, who are a tremendous asset to the future of our country. Here it is. This is the face of immigration in the 21st century. Unless Lois is up to that, I don't think one can top that. I listen to you all night, and I apologize to all the questions, the people who asked questions that they, they weren't asked here. But, uh,